Graduates, guests and colleagues, my name is Susie Braithwaite and I'm delighted to welcome you to graduation. I have a few announcements to make before we begin so that you can all relax and enjoy the ceremony. Graduates, an easy job to start with. Please check that your seat number matches the number on your ticket because you will be called to the stage in that order. If you discover that they don't match, our team of stewards will help you locate the correct seat. At the appropriate time, you will be invited by the stewards to stand, to make your way to the foot of the stairs, ready to head up the stairs and across the stage. All very straightforward. There are two things that make for a seamless ceremony. Firstly, as soon as the person ahead of you begins to cross the stage, please make sure you make your way up the stairs. Please don't wait until they've passed across the stage before you reach the top of the stairs. Secondly, don't let excitement and pride overwhelm you so much that you forget to pick up your degree parchment after you've crossed the stage. <laughs> if you do, don't worry, you'll still have graduated. But please don't try to go back because you'll collide with somebody coming the other way. Instead, please visit the graduation information desk in the exhibition centre where you collected your gown and tickets 30 minutes after the ceremony where you can collect your parchment. At the end of the ceremony, graduates, you will be asked to process out of the hall directed by the stewards, family and friends, the stewards will show you to the exits once the graduates have left the hall. If the fire alarm should sound at any point, please remain in your seats. Instructions will be given and we will escort you to the nearest exit. As graduates, you will join an international community of over 100,000 York alumni. The York Alumni Association holds many free events each year designed to help you make connections with other alumni across the world and to boost your career prospects. To ensure that the Alumni Association is able to contact you about these, please register your contact details at the stand in the Exhibition Centre, where you can also have a fun group photograph taken and collect your graduation pin. In April, you'll receive an email about a national survey the destinations of leavers from higher education. The survey focuses on a specific date in April and asks you about your activities on that date. Please take a few minutes to complete the survey and let us know what you're doing. The results will help us provide the right support for current students and make sure that we offer graduates like you the relevant information and opportunities. Finally, Please, would everybody turn off your mobile phone? And will you all now please stand?
I declare this congregation open for the conferment of awards. Chancellor, it is an honour and a privilege to introduce our honorary graduate, Professor Chris Somerville. Professor Somerville is a professor in the Department of Plant and Microbial Biology and director of the Energy Biosciences Institute at UC Berkeley, where he currently holds the Philomathia Chair in Alternative Energy. A Philomath is a lover of learning, and the Philomathia Foundation aims to promote human values and science through education and research. Prior to 2007, Chris was a professor at Stanford University and director of the Carnegie Institution for Science, Department of Plant Biology, and before that a professor at Michigan State University. He has published more than 200 scientific papers and patents in plant and microbial genetics, genomics, biochemistry and biotechnology. He is a member of the US National Academy of Sciences and a fellow of the Royal Society of London. He has received numerous scientific awards and has co-founded six scientific journals and four biotechnology companies. This extremely impressive, if somewhat abbreviated, CV really only scratches the surface of the achievements and impact of a highly influential career. From the early stages of his career, Chris demonstrated key traits that have led to not only a highly successful scientific career, but also one that has benefited and inspired an entire field and beyond. Soon after obtaining his PhD in bacterial genetics in the late 1970s, he became interested in plant biology at a time when the first experiments were being carried out on the development of methods for the transfer of DNA into plant genomes. Realizing that in order to make the most of this emerging technology, we would need to have a much better understanding of how plants work at the molecular level, he concluded, he concluded that we need a model, a lab rat, as it were, for plant scientists. To this end, during the 1980s and early 1990s, Chris and several colleagues pioneered the development of Arabidopsis thaliana as the model plant species. Their efforts led to its widespread adoption by tens of thousands of researchers around the world, culminating in the first plant genome sequence in 2000. A genome database he initiated to disseminate the combined genome and genetic information generates more than 30 million hits a year. At the same time, Chris was making major breakthroughs in our understanding of fundamental plant processes, including the biochemical processes associated with how plants capture energy from the sun and convert it to sugar, how plants make oil, and how they build complex cell walls to form massive structures and protect themselves from a harsh environment. He was also a hugely influential advocate for biotechnological application of this new knowledge for the improvement of crops, not just for food and feed production, but also for production of high-value chemicals and most recently cellulosic biofuels. One such example, published as a landmark paper in Science in 1992, was a demonstration that it is possible to engineer plants to produce biodegradable plastics the objective being to replace the environmentally damaging and petrochemically derived plastics that persist to such damaging effects in the, in the environment today. Going from proof of concept to commercial reality has been somewhat more challenging as many other factors come into play, not least government regulation and socioeconomics. And oil prices at around $30 a barrel, in fact dropping to $27 a barrel earlier, earlier this week, are unfortunately a major disincentive irrespective of the, of the environmental benefits that such technology represents. Following his move to Stanford University in the early 1990s, Chris was excited by the research of a group of ecologists who had started using satellite images to measure and build models of global ecosystem productivity. To encourage this field, he led the founding of an influential new institute at Stanford, the Carnegie Department of Global Ecology, which he considers one of his most important accomplishments. <clears throat> Excuse me. As a result, Chris was among the first plant scientists to recognize the important role of plants in helping to mitigate the impacts of carbon emissions on climate change. As the key organisms fixing carbon dioxide in the terrestrial biosphere, the use of plant products to make fuels and chemicals 
provides a carbon neutral alternative to our current dependence on fossil fuels. Chris led the way in the US for the drive towards sustainable biofuels based on inedible plant tissues to provide a source of fuels without impacting on global food security. Chris's efforts led to major governmental strategies for the adoption of cellulosic ethanol and advanced biofuels, supported by major research investments and helped to inspire international efforts in this sector, an opening of a number of commercial scale cellulosic ethanol plants around the world. Throughout his prodigious career, Chris has shown the remarkable ability to lead the world in cutting edge science, whilst at the same time informing and inspiring government policy and driving his research towards major impacts for the benefit of human society. <clears throat> Chris's work on bioenergy and impact driven research resonates with the strength and depth of industrial biotechnology in the University's Centre for Novel Agricultural Products and the wider departments of biology and chemistry. Like Chris, we strive to do world-class research with impact and are proud of the fact that York Biology ranks first in the UK for the impact of its science. We look forward to continuing interactions with Chris across a range of our research activities. So, for his remarkable achievements, for the inspiration that his energy and enthusiasm has given to so many scientists, and for the generosity of spirit he has always shown in sharing his ideas and critical thinking with others, Chancellor, it is an honour to present to you Professor Chris Somerville for the degree of Doctor of the University, Honoris Causa. Hold it there for a minute. By virtue of the powers vested in me by the University of York, I hereby confer upon you the degree of Doctor of the University, Honoris Causa. Well, Chancellor Grant, uh, graduates, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor for me to speak to you today, uh, somewhat briefly. Um, I particularly want to thank the university for this, uh, this honor and this opportunity. I only have a couple of things to say, but perhaps I begin by mentioning that I started school in a one-room schoolhouse with nine grades, 250 miles from the nearest paved road in the far north of Canada. And fortunately, my parents had a, had a, a compelling conviction that education was enabling and that everything was possible uh, for an educated person. And uh, they instilled that in me and actually uh, in, in, it's entirely everything I've managed to do in my life is entirely due to that commitment to, to education and to learning. Um, you know, now I live, I live in San Francisco, which is a, in, a, in, a, in a very vibrant intellectual and uh, engineering community that, you know, uh, I think many people will realize is one of the centers of the world in terms of creating new opportunities. And when I look back at where I came from, the distance is, is very, very large indeed, and entirely my ability to traverse it was due to an education. So, so I, I want to begin by saying congratulations to the graduates for also having embraced education, and I hope it's as good to you and it allows you to do the things uh, that you aspire to in the same way that it was uh, entirely enabling to me. Um, I think actually, you know, to, to graduate today is, is different than it was in my day. Uh, the availability of, you know, electronic uh, information resources has actually changed our relationship, everybody's relationship to information. It's now possible, as we know, to do a Google search and to get some sort of information about anything. And so now I think, and I hope this has been true of you, and I'm sure it's true of this great university, that to be honest, an education is even more important. Even though you can access information, the key to an education today is the context for that information. In general, you can't understand bits of information without context. And I hope that's how you'll think about your education uh, now and in the future, because um, it's, uh, you know, uh, learning is a lifelong experience. 
The other thing I guess I would just like to say is, in my long experience, is the importance of setting high goals, particularly at this juncture in your life, you're just beginning a new phase. Uh, when I look back over my years, I think, uh, and, 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 the, and the people that I grew up with and have, have, have known throughout my life, the, it's apparent that choosing high ambitious goals is a, is a key to, to being able to uh, explore your possibilities. Um, I, I have a, you know, I think it's very important to remember that everything that's done in the world is actually done by people just like you. There's, there's not some special class that makes everything happen. Um, I have a friend in the San Francisco Bay who, who grew up poor in India, uh, got into one of the IITs and got an engineering degree, and has gone on to make several billion dollars uh, in the course of creating a large number of important companies that have actually changed the world. He was an investor, in fact, in Google, uh, one of the early investors. And he has a very interesting, interesting view of, of uh, success or, or of creativity, perhaps, is a better word for it. Uh, he and others in Silicon Valley uh, use the motto, uh, fail early and fail often, which is a kind of an unusual motto. And obviously, it's not very appropriate for doctors or engineers. Uh, that would, <laughs> but for people perhaps in the arts or certainly in the sciences and certainly in, in the business world, it's an excellent motto. That is, uh, what it essentially means is, you know, don't be deterred by failure. Um, try again when you fail. And, and in order to do something genuinely new, you have to take the risk that you might fail. So, uh, so I want to encourage you to, uh, unless you're a doctor or, or, or an engineer or, or someone else that can't, for, can't afford to fail, uh, I, I want to, in, uh, I want to endorse that uh, philosophy as, uh, as you go out into the world. Whatever the case, uh, I, I, I wish you success as you enter the next phase of your life. Thank you very much. Chancellor, it is an honour and a privilege to introduce our honorary gradu graduand, Professor Lord Darcy of Denham. Lord Darcy already has more letters after his name than I could possibly list in a short address. But I'm very pleased that the University of York is adding to these, as his work embodies our approach to health care and the training of health professionals, treating patients with empathy and integrity underpinning clinical practice with good evidence, using science to innovate and develop new technologies, and applying scientific principles to health policy and system reform. Lord Darcy has worked across basic science, clinical practice, and health policy, and is world-renowned in all three areas. Lord Darcy is, first and foremost, a surgeon specialising in colorectal cancer surgery. Born of Armenian parents who were displaced by the 1915 genocide, he went to school in Baghdad. A childhood episode of meningitis and three weeks in hospital was perhaps one of the factors that inspired him to pursue a career in medicine. At the age of 17, he moved to Dublin to study and then to London, working first at Central Middlesex Hospital and later at St Mary's Hospital and Imperial College London, where he is now Chair of Surgery. The esteem in which he is held across the medical profession can hardly be overstated. He has been awarded fellowships by all of the Royal College of Surgeons in the British Isles, by the American College of Surgeons and the Academy of Medical Sciences. He has even been accepted by the enemy the Royal College of Physicians of both London and Ireland have swallowed their pride and conferred fellowships upon him too. And just a few weeks ago, his contribution to medicine was recognised by the Queen, who admitted Lord Darcy to the Order of Merit. Previous recipients in health care and medical research include Sir Magdi Yacoub, Dorothy Hodgkin, Dame Cicely Saunders and Florence Nightingale. Good company to keep. Lord Darcy's scientific interests are in developing and using technology to improve surgical techniques, particularly keyhole surgery, 
and surgical training, developing a virtual operating theatre. He leads a team investigating a wide spectrum of basic science and engineering, including med medical imaging and surgical robotics, earning him the nickname of RoboDoc at Imperium. His scientific research has resulted in over 800 publications and election to the Fellowship of the Royal Society. Finally, our graduate has contributed significantly to health policy development in our NHS and around the world. In 2007, Prime Minister Gordon Brown elevated him into the House of Lords and appointed him Health Minister, part of the government of all the talents. He was asked to lead a national review to plan the NHS for the next decade. On Desert Island Discs, Kirsty Young asked, with undisguised incredulity, why on earth he would take on such a role. Lord Darcy replied that he always enjoyed a challenge, and I'm sure he wasn't disappointed. The Darcy Report, High Quality Care for All, updated traditional notions of professionalism, replacing political command and control with transparency and professional accountability. Quality was to be the organising principle of the NHS. His call to centralise trauma, stroke and cardiac services has made a lasting difference to NHS patient care. He also helped to develop the skills, training and roles of nurses, including instigating nurse endoscopy and minor surgery in his own hospital. His approach to health policy mirrors his general approach to practice. He believes that reforms should be clinically led and evidence-based. And throughout his time as a health minister, he continued to practice, operating on a Friday so that he could follow his patients' progress over the weekend. Stepping down as health minister in 2009, Lord Darcy continued his clinical and academic work and expanded his policy horizons to become more involved in global health. Lord Darcy demonstrates a spirit of curiosity and scientific inquiry across all of his endeavours. My favourite example of this is when, frustrated by delays and inefficiencies in his operating theatre, he wanted to better understand patient flows around the hospital. Rather than asking for an administrative review or a research project, he decided to embrace qualitative methods and find out what the problems were himself. He went undercover, working a night shift as a hospital porter, and in the process, learned rather more than he expected about patient experiences, staff attitudes and hierarchies, and about the value of all members of the healthcare team. At a time when health policy development is losing touch, both with evidence and with frontline NHS staff, when the NHS is facing unprecedented challenges and upheaval, and when trust in the medical profession has been eroded, Aradazi stands out as a beacon representing the values and aspirations of those who want the very best for health care. He's truly an inspiration for us all. Chancellor, for his commitment to improving the quality of health care and for crossing the boundaries of basic science, clinical practice and health policy, I am honoured to present to you Professor Lord Darcy for the degree of Doctor of the University of York, Honoris Causa. By virtue of the powers vested in me by the University of York, it gives me great pleasure to confer upon you the degree of Doctor of the University, Honoris Causa. Thank you, Karen. I found out a lot of things I didn't know about myself, but uh, <laughs> Chancellor Grant, Vice Chancellor Lambert, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great, great privilege. I'm very, very touched to be here, and I, it's been a difficult time 
the last uh, few months for me, but being here, seeing you all graduate and you know, seeing all your families here, it's a very, very unique and a touching moment. So I can't thank you enough for giving me this amazing distinction and honor, which I'm very humbled by. Let me turn on to the students and the parents and say, it's a great privilege for me to be sharing with you this very important day. The degrees that you would have received or will be receiving later are worthy recognition of the amazing hard work, the blood, the sweat and tears that you have been unsparingly invested in over the years into these successful studies. And I'd like to congratulate your families and your loved ones too. You're all graduating today for one of the world's top universities, the University of York, an establishment with time-honored prestige, renowned internationally for thought leadership across the very disciplines you and yourselves have become formally accomplished in today, including the arts, the humanities, healthcare, economics is the one that I always collaborated with here in York, sciences, medicine, and also the social sciences. This is just to name few. For those who are qualifying today, your passport, your degree today is the passport for your future, a crucial enabler to support your personal journey towards the successes and the contaminants. Of course, the advantage of having a mature student like me getting the degree today, I could share with you some of my experiences uh, and the lessons that I've learned at the start of this journey. I think firstly, I implore you to look around your seats and recognize the vast wealth of talent, expertise and perspectives and ideas that are embod embodied in your fellow peers and colleagues. The challenges facing the world today are enormously complex and require multidisciplinary solutions. I've learned that throughout my career, and Karen touched on some of the roles and the development and the creation of a team around the needs of the patient. So collaboration is the way in which you will excel in the future. Secondly, stay nimble, challenge the status quo, just remember that, and recognize that the world is constantly changing beast. From the outset of my career, if I hadn't challenged what people told me or what I was taught, don't get me wrong, you've taught great things here, but challenge it when you go into practice. And certainly my experience, you know, the first challenge was in my training days, I was telling the medical students this morning who I met them, the bigger the incision, the better surgeon you were. That macho thing, you know, if you're ever stuck, enlarge the size of the surgical incision. Ten years later, we're operating through tiny keyholes. And that's really how science comes into practice, but at the same time, you have to have the right mindset to drive that. So, one final point, which I think is a very important one, which always pinch yourself and remember, you have to enjoy the journey. Success whatever that means to each and every one of you, will only come to those with passion, energy, and commitment for what they do. And that, always remember that. And regrettably, contrary to what the media will proclaim, it's unlikely to tell of overnight riches. It's a long journey, but enjoy it. So my recommendations to you all is to relish your chosen vocation, Experience everything that you possibly can. And do remember that as long as you're learning, being challenged, and enjoying that journey, then you are undoubtedly on the right path to your own success. So congratulations again, and thank you for having me. Ladies and gentlemen, 
Ensemble E Anonymi will perform Never Weather Beaten Sail by Hubert Parry, followed by Words by Ander Anders Edenroth. of the genius and the fool. Everybody, every day, everywhere and every day. Oh, words, find them, you can use them. Say them, you can hear them. Write them, you can read them. Love them, fear them. Words, transmitted as we faded from the start. Received by all and we're sentenced to a life with words. Impression of the stupid and the smart. Everybody, every day, you and I, we all can say words. Inside your head can come alive as they search. Softly, loudly, modestly, and proudly words. Expression by the living and the dead. Everybody, every day, everywhere, and every day. Oh, words. Find them, you can use them. Say them, you can hear them. Write them, you can read them, love them, fear them. Oh, 
Chancellor, <clears throat> I have the honour to present the following candidates for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy in Biology. For research and FGF signalling during Xenopus neural development, Hannah Brunsden. For research in distributed nesting in redwood ants, Samuel Ellis. For research in the functional assembly of the human MCM complex, Emma Hesketh. For research in the role of bacterial toxin systems within biofilms, Andrew King. For research and diversification of insects, James Rainford. For research in climate change ecology, Ruth Wade. For research in exploring how soil bacteria adapt to pesticides, Rachel Yale. For the degree of Doctor of Philosophy in Tissue Engineering and Regenerative Medicine. For research in MSC behaviour in 3D polyisopropyl acrylamide hydrogel environment. Hang on. Uh, <laughs> Dmitry Limonovs. For the degree of Master of Science in Biology. Ines Hernandez Perez. Pierre Van Grithuysen. For the degree of Master of Research in Ecology and Environmental Management, Barry Graham. For the degree of Master of Science in Bioscience Technology, Charlotte Hans. <laughs> David Coonton. <laughs> Jessica Locker. <laughs> Charlotte Morris. <laughs> James Philpot. Yixing Chen, Tom Udale, for the degree of Master of Science in Computational Biology and Bioinformatics, Binji Dong, Bryony Jones. For the degree of Master of Science in Ecology and Environmental Management, Lisa Bulmer. Andrew Clark. Robert DL. Nicholas Gerontus. Gareth Hay. Samuel Knowles, <laughs> Alexandra Wadia, <laughs> for the degree of Master of Science in Post-Genomic Biology, Evangelia Kunatudu, <laughs> Abigail Metcalf. Jennifer Rivers Mohan. <laughs> David Pierce. <laughs> Rowena Stone. <laughs> For the degree of Bachelor of Science in Bi Biochemistry, Jessica Monroe. For the degree of Bachelor of Science in Biology, David Bridgewood. 
Ashley Goulding. For the degree of Bachelor of Science in Genetics, Emily Fotopoulou. <laughs> For the degree of Bachelor of Science in Molecular Cell Biology, Charlotte Heaven. <laughs> Gabrielle Smith. Chancellor, I have the honour to present the following candidates for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy in Chemistry. For research in supercritical extraction of C4 biomass, Thomas Attard. For research in responsive pneumatic polymer and elastomer particles, Kirsty Davy. For research in new insights into bio-based epoxy resins, Cheng Ding. For research in harnessing the catalytic transfer of magnetism, Alexander Hooper. For research in mesoporous silica and carbon materials, Teng Yao Zhang. For research and analysis of protein crystallization parameters, Joby Kirkwood. For research in direct imine acylation in heterocyclic synthesis, Christiana Kitsiu. For research in catalysis and natural product total synthesis, Thomas Ronson. For research in renewable materials from renewable resources, Guang Miao Chan. <laughs> For research in a microalgae Ascophyllum nodosum biorefinery, Yuan Yuan. <laughs> For the degree of Master of Science by Research in Chemistry, Alexander Hawes. Gareth Rees. <laughs> For the degree of Master of Science in Green Chemistry and Sustainable Industrial Technology, Matteo Borgioli. <laughs> Adrienne Galant Langton. <laughs> Maria Magro. Max Mosley. <laughs> Alberto Orsini. <laughs> David Pox. <laughs> David Ramsey. <laughs> James Shannon. Charlotte Stavicki. How <laughs> Shah. <laughs> For the degree of Bachelor of Science in Chemistry, Thomas Bacon. <laughs> Rosa Clubley. <laughs> Zachary Gawley. Evelyn Sigley. <laughs> For the degree of Bachelor of Science in Chemistry, Resources and the Environment, Rosemary Tuthill. <laughs> For the degree of Bachelor of Science, Robert Pryor. Chancellor, 
I have the honour to present the following candidates for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy by Publication in Health Sciences for research in reducing substance misuse problems in hospitals, Noreen Majeji. For the degree of Doctor of Philosophy in Health Sciences for research in social and ethnic inequalities, Nurja Upov. For the degree of Master of the Science in Applied Health Research, Bukak Aidin. <laughs> Charlotte Boyer. <laughs> Elizabeth Cook. <laughs> and Charlotte Southern. For the degree of Master of Science in Cognitive Behavioural Therapy for Advanced Clinical Practice, Jodie Clark. <laughs> for the degree of Master of Science in Hematopathology, Nora Gasmaseed. <laughs> for the degree of Master in Public Health, Rachel Cunningham Burley. If you are new, Debbie Azu. <laughs> Annabelle Jip. <laughs> Christopher Good. <laughs> Jennifer Logie. <laughs> Edward Miller. Andrea Musa. <laughs> Yanash Niak. <laughs> Ashna Narf. <laughs> Chika Noah. <laughs> Faith Odeed. William Blues. Felicity Pocklington. Sheila Uchigbu. Christopher Wilcoxon. And Jack Wilkinson. For the degree of Master in Nursing, Adult, Rebecca Carr. <laughs> Louise Dale. <laughs> Sarah Odes. <laughs> Gemma Redfern. Stephen Rowell. <laughs> Claudia Tomai. <laughs> Cheryl Twig. <laughs> For the degree of Bachelor of Arts in Midwifery Practice, Rianne Fairs. Cassie Forster. <laughs> Rebecca Galloway. <laughs> Charlotte Herod. <laughs> Carly Johnson. <laughs> Joanne Lilly. Samantha MacDonald.
Lauren Mitchell. Lucinda Moffat. Rebecca Welsh. And Anna Zagatsky. For the degree of Bachelor of Science in Health and Social Care Practice, Samantha Armstrong. <laughs> Nicola Galton. <laughs> Megan Holgate. <laughs> Elizabeth Horseman. Rose Kudzadombo. <laughs> Jacqueline Mason. <laughs> and Una Murphy. <laughs> For the degree of Bachelor of Science in Health and Social Care Practice, Short-Term Cognitive Behavioural Therapy, Peter Whittaker. For the degree of Bachelor of Science in Nursing, adult, Susan Anderson. <laughs> Bryony Ashcroft. <laughs> Rachel Ashton. <laughs> Catherine Askew. Helen Atkins. Amber Atkinson. Amy Baker. Karen Banks. Charlotte Bell. Marissa Blurton. <laughs> Hannah Bolton. <laughs> Emma Boovum. <laughs> Rachel Boyer. <laughs> Julie Bruff. Alice Carrington. Anna Ornajska. Lizzie Colley. Leon Colley. Eleanor Collins. Nicola Conway. <laughs> Helen Cunningham. <laughs> Sarah Davis. <laughs> Sarah Dujon. <laughs> Tessa Dixon Phillip. Stephanie Dobson. <laughs> Rebecca Doyle. <laughs> Emma Drew. <laughs> Teresa Dunwell. <laughs> Jill Falconer. Ellie Farnworth. <laughs> Philippa Farvin. <laughs> Amy Ferguson. 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 Amy Ferguson. Amy Fergu
Emily Finnerty. Harriet Forbes. David Gilliatt. Emily Hall. Georgina Hill. Natalie Hodson. Karen Hookins. Neelam Hussein. Hannah Jackson. Ruth Jacobs. Gillian Johnston. Rachel Jones. Marie Kelly. Hannah Kennedy. Marta Kubitsa. Louise Victoria Lampton. Rachel Lancaster. Samantha Lane. Sasha Lindley. Abigail Mann. Gabby McVan. Washeen McCormack. Janice McClafferty. Militia Mitchell. Sarah Mitchell. Chloe Moran. Sarah Moss. Grace of Four River. Bethany Aldridge. Kaylee Pilkington. Hannah Priestley. <laughs> Olivia Rainey. <laughs> Nichelle Weeke. <laughs> Georgine, Georgina Richardson. <laughs> Alicia Riley. Lucy Roberts. <laughs> Katie Jane Ryder. <laughs> Harriet Seeley. <laughs> Kathy Singleton. <laughs> Louise Sessons. Lydia Smethurst. <laughs> Holly Smith. <laughs> Ruth Spenlove. <laughs> Ellie Sugden. <laughs> Mike Spack.
Sim Tallo. <laughs> Hannah Thompson. <laughs> Sally Vickery. <laughs> Joseph Waddington. Jessica Wardle, <laughs> Emily Wardman, <laughs> Amy Watson, <laughs> Kathleen Whiteley, <laughs> Holly Wills. Charlotte Wilton, <laughs> Elizabeth Zavaraya, <laughs> for the degree of Bachelor of Science in Nursing, Child Charlotte Campbell, <laughs> Emma Green. Lily Haywood. Amber Hobson. Claire Preston. Gemma Reed. Abigail Walker. For the degree of Bachelor of Science in Nursing, Learning Disability, Rebecca Bean. <laughs> Kirsty Colley. <laughs> Sarah Ellsworth. <laughs> Natasha Hudson. Connie Whitaker, For the degree of Bachelor of Science in Nursing, Mental Health, Lucy Atkinson. Yasmin Bowerman. Hazel Chakanyuka. Jacob Conboy, <laughs> Jeanette Del Pledge, <laughs> Lauren Freeman, <laughs> Andrew Gordon, <laughs> Tana Higgins. Zuri Higgins. <laughs> Helen Lindsay. <laughs> Ethel Milo. <laughs> Carix, Caris Moxham. <laughs> Philip Noon. Clarice Penny. Oh, sorry. Oh, Emma Ollis, sorry. Emma Ollis. So, Claire. Claire Penny. Amy Zara. Janice Shaw. Olivia Smith. <laughs> Danielle Stannard.
I'm Jessica Wilson. For the degree of Bachelor of Science, Ordinary in Care Related Studies, Genesea Aspinall. For the degree of Diploma of a Higher Education in Care Related Studies awarded posthumously, Alex Moore. The award is being collected by Rob Moore, Alex's brother. For the degree, for the degree of For the degree of foundation degree in health and social care, Associate Practitioner Carolyn Byron. <laughs> Vanessa Donkin. Cameron Dusai. Martin Hennessy. Arlena Kuaska. Sarah Lord. Rachel McDade. Georgina Roberts. Jennifer Stevens. and Ellie Worrell. Chancellor, I have the honour to present the following candidates. For the degree of Doctor of Philosophy in Physics, for research in electron microscopy of single atom migration, Thomas Martin. <laughs> for research in energy transport in high density laser plasmas, Mohammed Shazad. For research in the metric space approach to quantum mechanics, Paul Sharp. <laughs> For the degree of Master of Science in Fusion Energy, Christopher David Baird. <laughs> Scott Doyle. Michael Johnson. Thomas Walsh. Joshua Ward Locken. For the degree of Master of Physics in Physics, Thomas Chan. Adam Smith. Jordan Tucker. For the degree of Master of Physics in Physics with Astrophysics, James Chan. Martin Gosling. Robert Miller. For the degree of Master of Physics in Theoretical Physics, Thomas May.
Gattis Sia. James Sheard. For the degree of Bachelor of Science in Physics, Luke Barton. Samuel Bennett. Yushen Du. Lara Turner. Andrew Vollum Foster. For the degree of Bachelor of Science in Physics with Astrophysics, Andrew Hurst. For the degree of Bachelor of Science in Physics with Business Management, Sami Al Suedi. For the degree of Bachelor of Science in Theoretical Physics, Michael James. For the degree of Bachelor of Science, Andrew Bruff. I now confer awards upon all other graduates who have elected to take their awards in absentia. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the first thing that falls to me to do this morning is to express again our warmest congratulations to all those who have graduated from the University of York and on whom I have had the extreme privilege of conferring degrees. It may have become clear to you that I'm a novice in this. This is actually my first degree ceremony as Chancellor of the University of York. So please forgive all the mistakes so far and those that are about to follow. But um, <laughs> I would like, first of all, actually to pay tribute to the man who preceded me and whom nobody can follow, which is Greg Dyke. Uh, Greg is known to, I think, everybody in this room as the former director general of the BBC, uh, from which post he was unceremoniously removed by virtue of standing up to the government. And then he became the chairman of the Football Association, which he currently still occupies. But all that I can say about Greg is I can't follow him, but he's been every, ever so supportive to me uh, in trying to ensure that I didn't fall uh, too flat on my face with the mystical ceremonies of the University of York. So um, it's a f I just love graduation ceremonies, by the way. I just, just love the way in which we see students coming across this platform and leaving this institution with an award from one of the top universities in the world. See, it's... It's two things, really, isn't it? It's, it's a ceremony. It's a formal ceremony in which those who have graduated today came into York as undergraduates or as postgraduates. They came into this room as graduands, and they're now graduates, some of them graduates again, uh, some of them multiple offenders in the University of Life. But the, the opportunity we have this morning is not just to have that ceremony, but to actually have a celebration because this is, I think, one of the most moving and most memorable occasions in a family's life, uh, to see yet another goalpost reached and passed. So my warmest congratulations to everybody here. It's not a passport to success in the world, but it is a life-enhancing benefit to have graduated from this great university. So when I was selected as chancellor, I must say I felt immensely honored and, and privileged. And um, of course, I've wondered ever since what were the processes that went into that and how many uh, turned it down um, uh, before it came to me. But I was reminded recently of when I was appointed to become the chairman of NHS England. And um, this, by the way, if you take up the notion of challenge that both Lord Darcy and Chris Somerville mentioned, you can imagine that this is challenge with capital letters. But um, 
The story circulated subsequently that the government had initially approached somebody else. And the somebody else was Alan Milburn, who was a former health secretary and now holds the role of chancellor of the University of Lancaster, which is somewhere on the other side of the Pennines. <laughs> and um, Alan's response to the approach allegedly was, do I look as if I have the word mug written across my forehead? And the civil servants consulted for some time and agreed that it didn't look as if he had the word mug, and therefore they needed to go and find somebody who did. <laughs> Whereupon my phone started to ring, and the invitation was given. But it gives me an opportunity to add a personal note to the eulogies that were paid this morning to our honorary graduates. First, for Chris Somerville, I don't think anybody should underestimate the sheer importance of plant science and plant science biotechnology in the modern world. Indeed, in many universities, it's been neglected for decades. But today, in York and in one or two other institutions, it's become an area of acute focus in a global environment uh, where famine and pestilence still ruin the lives of millions of people, billions of people around the globe. Likewise, with Lord Darcy, whose work in pioneering healthcare has been fundamental to our thinking across the NHS in how we can transform the way in which our unique and brilliant model of the NHS carries out its responsibilities for the future, for the population of England. Indeed, I knew that my fate was sealed when I went into the interview room four years ago to see an extraordinary high-level panel wishing to cross-examine me as to my fitness to be the chair of NHS England and to see Aradazi sitting there, inscrutable and wise, except in that final respect. So, Ara, thanks a lot. <laughs> so, look, I've sat figuratively in every seat of this house. I, I've sat as an undergraduate. Uh, I've sat as a postgraduate. I've sat as a proud parent on three occasions, plus a couple of postgraduate events thrown in. And, um, of course, I've conferred degrees. And, in fact, by mistake, I've even occasionally been an honorary graduate. But I must say, the vista that one has from each of those positions is exactly the same. It's one of sheer joy, sheer thrill, sheer excitement that we are gathered together today to celebrate uh, such achievements. So... Um, there are special, I think, benefits also for, for staff and, and those sitting on the platform, one of which is a demonstration of one of the most exceptional inventions of modern technology, which is the high heel. <laughs> I've been at lesser institutions where wages, where money has passed in the front row as to whether any particular candidate might make it <laughs> across the platform. And um, I'm happy to say that so far, uh, no bets have been collected. But it does remind me of a story uh, of, of, of a student at a graduation crossing uh, the platform rather like this, uh, rather exuberantly showing off to the crowd, uh, only to fall flat down into an open trap door. <laughs> Whereupon his mother in the audience was heard to say, it's just the stage he's going through. So, what is it? What is it about universities? What is it? Why, why, why is it that we're actually here? It's because I think universities have enduring values. We, we, we concentrate on, the, on these values, I think, to underpin what universities do, and not just in York, not just even in Yorkshire, not just even in the UK, but the global phenomenon of the modern university is an extraordinary phenomenon. One of the issues that's currently constantly debated in the national press is that of freedom of speech on the campus. Uh, there's been an argument as to whether the statue of Cecil Rhodes that stands with Oriel College in Oxford uh, should be taken down uh, because, to many, he represents the undesirable face of exploitation of the 19th century. Other instances have been the attempt to ban Germaine Greer, of all people, uh, from speaking at an event in Cardiff. I raise it today, it's a different sort of protest and dissent from that which rightly characterizes universities and campuses. 
If we do not have dissent, if we don't have protest, then we're going to become, I would suggest, unexciting institutions, stultifyingly boring, and turning out dull graduates. So there's got to be life, there's got to be energy on the campus. And if life is to be suppressed on university campuses, where will that suppression fall next? And one of the great values to me of British society lies in that freedom of speech and the freedom to object. Compare the announcement yesterday of the potential culpability of President Putin in relation to the murder of a citizen on British soil. In not many countries would it have been possible to have conducted such an investigation, to have published the findings publicly, and to have asked the government to step forward and take action. So the UK is not actually the founding father of universities. They were initially set up in, as long ago as the 10th and 11th centuries in Spain uh, and in Italy. But um, we do have two great universities, uh, now evolving slowly for 800 years and um, evolving slowly also for the future, uh, particularly in terms of their Byzantine governance. I, sorry, I was pro-vice-chancellor at Cambridge, and I'm allowed to say these things. But the, but the governance of some of our older universities is completely different uh, from the model of our modern universities, and particularly a smaller university such as York. I am so impressed by York, not just the fact that I've had a traditional Yorkshire welcome of warmth and generosity and kindness and sympathy, but also that it has the capacity on a small campus uh, to gather together an entire community of individuals, all of whom can spark off each other and fulfill that fundamental function of a university, which is that not just are you taught by distinguished faculty, but that actually there is education between us. In fact, so diverse is everybody in this room that I wager this is the first time you have sat here together wearing an identical uniform. <laughs> so where does it come from? Where does, where, 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 does, where does this idea come from? It comes from the monastic establishment of universities, those hoods which used to be worn over the head uh, in order to provide winter protection, the thick gowns, the monasticism, which survived in a realm in which the universal language of education and scholarship was Latin. And yet today, we could be attending a graduation ceremony in York, or in Siberia, or in Hong Kong, or in Chile, or in Beijing, and we would see a very close similarity, not in the garb of those sitting in the audience, but in the garb of those sitting as graduates. It's one of the most astonishing things that our monasticism stretches to Beijing. And to, I, by the way, I've been to these ceremonies, and I can assure you uh, that the garb is, is very, very similar. Since I've come to York, I've had the huge advantage of understanding much better the research agenda in York, and it's been presented to us this morning also, that concentration not on the Victorian model of shepherding knowledge into preordained silos, but on a genuine encompassing of multidisciplinarity. And I'm so impressed by so many of the degrees that have been awarded this morning that span across the different disciplines, which allow us to think beyond the traditional models, but in ways that... Um, are absolutely essential for the future of society. Let me suggest, for example, in relation to global climate change or in relation to the future of medicine, no single discipline has this. It's only by bringing them together that we can fully understand how we solve some of the problems of tomorrow. It's now being widely said, particularly on the west coast of America, that in medicine, it's going to be data science that will bring greater benefits to mankind in the next 20 years than it will be medical science. And so it's essential for us to understand and deploy our talents. So um, what I can say is that uh, I can't remember a word of the graduation speech when I graduated. I don't think I can remember any words of the other ones I've attended, actually. But um, so I take great fortitude in that revelation by knowing that what I say today will have not the slightest influence <laughs> on anybody. But let me just, I think, recite a few things which I do believe are particularly important as you go into the world, for many of you, the second time or, or the third time. 
First of all, a PhD is an extraordinary degree. A PhD in a world in which there's often an assumption that the attention span of the average young person is about five minutes of Big Brother. Uh, to have somebody sit for three, four, or more years working away on a highly specific, highly complicated, really difficult problem to earn a PhD is an extraordinary testament to the energy that still runs through our society. And so the imagination and energy and innovation that we are able to capture in a university such as York, I hope will infiltrate forever your thinking about the world and your contribution that you can make to it. I hope also that I will have plenty of opportunities in the future to keep in contact with you, to understand where you're going and what your ambitions are and what your achievements will be. The alumni message of universities is extremely important. I have to say, when I was a vice chancellor at a university, the engagement with alumni who kept a lifelong affection for the institution was one of the most uplifting parts of the job. And so please, maintain contact with York, and um, York will do its best to continue to generate the pride in you that you feel today from graduating from this great institution. So, it's time for a bit of celebration. What I'm going to invite the audience, our parents and others to do, please stand and will you join me in expressing our applause and congratulations to all of our graduates today. Thank you, but I'm not quite finished. <laughs> I'm going to ask our graduates to reciprocate. Please, be upstanding and express your thanks to parents and family and others. By the way, cheering is permitted. Ladies and gentlemen, I declare this congregation closed. Thank you so much for coming today.